Um, this was my girlfriend's trip to, to France. It's, this is her every movement, and this is all available on Google for every one of you if you're a Google user. And a lot, something that people don't know that surprises them is every one of your Google searches is, is stored. So you can go online to Google. It's google.com slash history. And you could go see every one of your searches from 2007, 8, 9. Uh, you could see what you were thinking in the moment. And it's pretty revealing to see because our searches are our thoughts. It's what we're thinking, what we want in the moment at the time. And that's all available, all stored there. So how does Google so good at personalizing your service? Because it remembers everything. And there's a big controversy right now, of course, over surveillance, over government surveillance, and this question of whether the government's reading your email. And this is from a great website called Obama is Checking Your Email. It's full of pictures of Obama looking at people's computers. But the, the point is that, um, you know, the, Obama said, nobody's listening to your calls. Don't be paranoid. Don't be stupid. Of course, we're not tapping into your phones. But, but are they? Um, it turns out the NSA, so if, if I make a call to you, they don't look at the content of our conversation. They look at everything around that call. They look at when it was placed, who it's being placed between, and any of their circumstances. And that's called metadata. And that's their defense, basically. They're saying we're not reading the content, we're reading the metadata. And as I'll explain in more detail, that's just as revealing, if not more revealing, than the content itself. Now let's talk about the NSA leaks for a moment. What was the significance of them? So, Obviously, governments have some right to do national security related spying and, you know, what do we expect really? What do we think they're doing? Um, but if we look at the documents, if we look at what was released in the Snowden documents, what the, the conclusion of it basically is that 90% of the people that are caught up in these spy dragnets are innocent. Um, in the process of trying to find one terrorist, one criminal, 90% of the information collected will be for completely innocent people, not related at all to security purposes. Now, maybe that's okay. Maybe, you know, to find that one criminal, we need to throw in 90% of people's information. And maybe that's a justification, that's a trade-off as a society we're willing to make. But the point is that we didn't even know this was, this, this was happening until these documents were released. And what is in that 90%? And this is from uh, the Washington Post. It tells stories of heartbreak, illicit, illicit sexual liaisons, mental health crises, political and religious conversations, financial anxieties, d disappointed hopes. So this is what we reveal in our electronic communications, and this is all collected through governments. And anytime you use Facebook, Google, any internet service, just assume that you know, you're sharing it with the government, because essentially you are. And it's not just um, you know, that the NSA has gotten more aggressive. Things have actually changed in surveillance. There's been a sea change in the way surveillance is done. So before, if I wanted to track somebody, and I work in the government, it, I would send a car after them. They'd follow them around everywhere. They'd write down notes on who they talked to, what they did. It costs approximately $275 an hour. Now, if I want to track somebody, I put a GPS device on their car, or better yet, I just tap into their phone. That costs $5 an hour. It's 98% cheaper to conduct surveillance than it used to be. So there has been a, a massive exponential change in the way surveillance is conducted. And what happens when the price of something drops? It becomes more accessible. So now surveillance is open to corporations, to, to uh, you know, uh, aggressive spouses. <coughs> surveillance is affordable and, and available to anybody that wants it. And we can no longer control what's collected about us. In the past 10, 20 years ago, you know, your official documents were the most important thing. You'd put them in a safe, you'd put them in a safe place in your house. Your birth certificate, your tax forms, your passport, that's all you had to worry about. Now the information that's collected about you is from a whole variety of sources. We have an entire online ecosystem that tracks everything you click, everything you purchase, from what you do at your grocery store in person, to the mall, to what you do on Facebook, and what you do on Amazon. Uh, we have biometric systems that collect your, your uh, body information and collect where you've, tr where you've been and track that. Uh, drones, which are essentially flying cameras with intelligence now, are becoming much, much more popular. Um, and surveillance cameras. There's 250 million surveillance cameras in the world. And this was the original internet we used to know. This is a really famous New Yorker cartoon from um, 1993, I believe, yeah. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that, that used to be true, you know. No one knew who the hell anybody was on the internet. You could be anybody, you could say you are anybody you want. Your screen names were anonymous, it was just a bunch of characters. There was no concept of identity on the internet. Now, it's totally different. We have real-time bidding and very, very targeted ads that can not only tell that, you know, you are this specific individual, but it can show us different things. We could be looking at the same website and see two totally, completely different ads based on who we are and based on our attributes, based on our age, our gender, where we live, how much money we have. All this is possible in real time now. And I guess it's this paradox about the internet. 86% of people have tried to take steps to minimize um, their online trails to improve their privacy. Yet Google, Facebook, all these services have never been more popular. So what gives here? And for people like me who care about privacy and security, this is the question and it drives everyone crazy. 
Why is it that we all say we care about privacy on an individual level, but then our actions are completely opposite? And our identities have converged. It used to be on the internet, nobody knew if you were a dog. Now, thanks to social media, our real identities are tied to our digital trails. And Facebook was really the pioneer here. If you remember early, early social network days, it was MySpace. You can still have a screen name, you can still be relatively anonymous. Now with Facebook, your real name is tied to everything you do. That was Facebook's main innovation back in the day, using your real name. And it was really big on college campuses for that reason, because it provided this level of authenticity. But that made it okay to use your real name with everything. If we go back 10 years, that was the moment it shifted where we became okay with real identity. It was all thanks to Facebook. Now our identities exist in all sorts of places. There's hundreds of thousands of us out there, that little bits of us, little reflections of who we are, that are collected and held by various people. At each digital, digital transaction we do, clicks and builds those profiles. I don't think people realize the extent to which everything is tracked and collected on the internet. Everything is recorded, more or less.